Yeah. All right, cool. So today we're going to be discussing uh, the second part of the first section of We Are Indivisible. Now, as I mentioned in the last episode, um, we discussed a little bit of how we got here and we talked about how our democracy is buckling and also how our democracy is being rigged. And we started talking a little bit about how our democracy is buckling yesterday and we talked about how uh, our parties have become polarized, which for the longest was what kept the entire American uh, democracy system together, but it's essentially uh, what's leading to uh, the current downfall. Now, um, polarization, like par party polarization in itself is not a negative thing um, when you think about it because essentially polarization means that the people in, um, in that party, the people we're electing, they're going to represent our ideas and um, they're not going to get lost in, in the weeds, which before, um, you know, before the parties were polarized, before you could have voted for a Democrat up north and that Democrat up north would have had to compromise with a southern segregationist Democrat so that um, whatever it was that you thought you were voting for, um, you probably weren't going to get. Whereas now, yeah, we have differences between um, AOC and uh, Nancy Pelosi, but for the most part, the differences aren't that far apart, um, which is actually uh, it highlights the importance of voting in um, primary. So given that party uh, polarization isn't, again, completely wrong, if you look at other democracies, um, it, party polarization exists. You know, you look at Finland, um, they've got a socialist uh, party and, you know, um, the idea uh, um, with uh, party polarization is that you elect a party, they implement their plan, and then they're judged of the results of that plan. Well, the problem with party polarization is that when you take that and then you combine it with uh, our American political institutions, that's when we get into trouble. The reason we get into trouble is the following. When the founders implemented uh, the um, current system that we have in America, they did not imagine that we would have ideologically polarized parties. They figured the country's way too big and way too um, diverse um, it, uh, in, in order for all these separate factions to come together and unite. And you know, clearly, obviously, they were wrong um, because it's happened. And essentially, the last couple uh, years, um, what we've experienced uh, in, in American society is we've got a minority party that really doesn't have any uh, incentive to cooperate and a majority party which is never in a position to enact policies. And uh, the reason for that is I actually skipped over a little bit, um, but basically to pass an agenda right now, a party needs, a, it needs the presidency the Senate and the House. Now, um, if they don't have all three, um, a minority, uh, um, you know, the, the, the minority uh, ideologically motivated um, other side, I guess, could, there's certain rules and um, things along the way that they can um, do in order to um, keep that, um, like the majority party from implementing their agenda. The reason for those rules was that they wanted, uh, the founders wanted to prevent tyranny, the tyranny of the majority, which is basically just the, the majority coming in and telling everybody what to do. But what it's basically led to has been... The filibuster is racist. The filibuster is racist? Yeah. Well, it's led to... It means that only people in like rural states that are mostly white have more power in the federal government. Well, it's led to like, tyranny of the minority. Yeah. Essentially, you've got... Uh, you know the the minority now they're just keeping anything from being implemented, and it used to not be that way. It used to be that vetoes were only used sparingly, but this it also when I say used to, I mean back when it was only rich white men oh, walking yeah. around the yeah, halls of Congress. Yeah, it's a lot easier to compromise when everybody looks like you than it is when there's women and people of color there, right? You would, it's not a lot easier, but they, they, they act like it was a lot easier to compromise back then, right? But anyways, so like, 
what's happening now is that even with all three, right, the opposition has ways to stop things from, um, has, has ways to uh, stop, stop things uh, from getting done, from getting implemented, right? And, and, and going back to what I said, basically we have um, uh, the minority party, which has no incentive to cooperate, and then the majority party, which is never in position to enact policies, which as the people, what is, you know, the effects that we see is constant gridlock, constant shutdowns, and no progress despite the fact that a lot of the things that we need and a lot of the things that our society needs are getting worse, whether economically, climate change, and whatnot. So, um, like, the logic, essentially, like, the, the, the logic that's at work here, which it's horrible logic, is basically, if the president doesn't get anything done, and if you're in the opposition, then voters are gonna punish that party in the next election, right? And if you know this, why would you work with the party that's in power if you're a part of the opposition? If you know you're not gonna, going to be getting blamed for anything that's going on, right? But it basically creates a cycle where Democrats get elected, Rep Republicans work against that agenda, Democrats get punished, so voters, you know, we don't see no results. We, we punish uh, Democrats by electing Republicans, and then, you know, Democrats become the minority party, but then now they use those same tools to work against the majority party. And again, the, at the end of the day, the losers, like the real losers, is everyone, but, well, everyone, and I mean everyday Americans, right? But specifically, uh, progressives. And the reason that I say progressives is that we're the ones that actually want to get things done, right? And, and what I mean by that is that we think that we need to fix things now. We need to fix healthcare now. We need to fix gun violence. We need to fix climate change. Um, I mean, you name it, what am I missing? Economic and racial uh, inequality. All of these things that are real issues and that are only getting worse. Um, you know, as progressives, we really can't make any movement there. So I said all that to say that uh, voting, rights. voting rights, well, yeah, they also impact voting rights. But I said all that to say that essentially what's happened is that every election in recent years, the gap between what our politicians promise and what they're actually able to deliver has widened. And I mean, essentially, yeah, our democracy is buckling, but this is not a both sides are to, are to blame story. Um, people, you know, when we see this, we like to um, attribute blame to both parties and say that it's both their fault. But it's actually not true. Republicans are actually rigging our democracy. And I'll be picking up on that on the next episode. So I appreciate any questions uh, we might have as a follow-up. Did we get any questions uh, during the video? I appreciate um, my uh, producer throwing me questions from the crowd. But with that, um, yeah, um, again, We Are Indivisible. It's by Leah Greenberg and S for Levin. If you follow the, you know, this episode and the prior two, like we're barely getting started, barely making a dent. We're gonna be discussing um, a democracy, how our democracy is currently being rigged. And I know I'm giving you a lot of bad, but over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about some, some of the solutions and some of the things that we can do in order to uh, solve or, I guess, attack these roadblocks that are currently being uh, created in our um, democracy. So, appreciate you tuning in. Um, look forward to the next episode. Thanks.